Hi guys, welcome back to my channel, Obs and Gain Made Easy. In today's video, I'm going to discuss ectopic pregnancy. What is an ectopic pregnancy? This is implantation of an ovum or embryo outside the uterus. The incidence of ectopic pregnancy is about 1-2% to of the pregnancies, and it's one of the common causes of maternal morbidity and mortality. Side of implantation. The most common ectopic pregnancies are tubal ectopic pregnancies, which account for 95-98% to of the pregnancies. This is where you find that a fertilized egg implants inside the fallopian tube instead of the uterine cavity. The most common site of implantation in the fallopian tube is the ampullary region, which accounts for 80% of the cases. The next common site is the isthmus, which accounts for 12% of the cases. And the next site is the fimbrio end, also known as the infundibulum, which accounts for 5-11% to 11 of the, the cases. The next site is the interstitium, which accounts for 2-3% to 3 of the cases. It's also known as a corneal pregnancy. The interstitium is a region between the uterus and the fallopian tube so it's a uterine fallopian junction so these pregnancies can actually grow to be very large and when they rupture they cause massive hemorrhage so corneal or interstitial pregnancies grow to be quite large because the space here is larger than any of the space in the fallopian tube so the patient can even present late as far as 16 weeks gestation age the less common sites of implantation are the ovary the cervix the broad ligament, also known as an abdominal ectopic pregnancy, can also implant in a previous caesarean section scar. So you have a caesarean scar ectopic pregnancy. It can also implant inside the myometrium. So it's called an intramural ectopic pregnancy. Heterotopic pregnancies are very rare. This is where you have a both intrauterine and ectopic pregnancies. They occur together. So you have an intrauterine pregnancy as well as an ectopic pregnancy etiology of ectopic pregnancy so ectopic pregnancies have been associated with abnormal function of the fallopian tubes remember that the fallopian tubes help collect and transport the egg and embryo into the uterus but what happens in ectopic pregnancy you find that the integrity of either the fimbrio end or the tube itself or the cilia that help sweep the egg and embryo into the uterus have a defect they have a problem so what causes this problem in the fallopian tube? It could be a congenital tubal anomalies, for example, a diverticulum in the fallopian tube. Pelvic inflammatory disease increases the risk of having an ectopic pregnancy by 6 to 10 times than a patient who has never had a pelvic inflammatory disease. Remember that pelvic inflammatory disease is a spectrum of disease caused by a genital infection, commonly sexually transmitted infection. The most common associated sexually transmitted infection is chlamydia trachomatis, which has been known to cause a pelvic inflammatory disease. But of course, it can also be caused by other sexually transmitted infections like gonorrhea. So one of the complications of pelvic inflammatory disease or sexually transmitted infections is salpingitis, which is infection and inflammation of a fallopian tube. So the complication of that inflammation is that there's formation of adhesions as well as fibrosis in the fallopian tube. So this causes narrowing of the lumen of the fallopian tubes as well as destruction of the cilia which helps sweep the embryo or the egg. And because of this fibrosis, it can cause pockets to form in the fallopian tube which can trap the egg. So instead of the egg being swept into the uterine cavity, it gets stuck in the fallopian tube. History of having a previous ectopic pregnancy increases the risk of you having another ectopic pregnancy. This is probably because you still have the risk factors that cause the first ectopic pregnancy. History of having tubal anastomosis surgery also increases the risk of having an ectopic pregnancy because it can cause scarring and narrowing of the tube. Some contraceptive methods increase the risk of having an ectopic pregnancy, like a bilateral tubal ligation. In a bilateral tubal ligation, it has a 1-3% to failure rate. So in patients who've had a BTL and it has failed, one-third of those have an increased risk of having an ectopic pregnancy. Intrauterine devices prevent intrauterine pregnancies as well as ectopic pregnancy. But should a patient conceive whilst having an intrauterine device in situ, the risk of having an ectopic pregnancy increases. Progestin-only pills have also been associated to increase the risk of ectopic pregnancy. This is because progesterone 
causes impaired tubal motility. Tubal endometriosis because of invasion of tissue in the fallopian tube which can cause obstruction of the fallopian tube. Infertility is also associated with ectopic pregnancy. This is probably because tubal diseases are what's causing the infertility. Studies have also shown that assisted reproductive techniques like in vitro fertilization has also been associated to increase the risk of having an ectopic pregnancy. Cigarette smoking causes hypoxia and damage to the cilia in the fallopian tube. Ectopic pregnancy can be classified into a ruptured ectopic or unruptured ectopic pregnancy. Clinical features of an ectopic pregnancy. So a patient will come to you with history of having abdominal pain and they'll point to you in the iliac fossa. The abdominal pain is usually at the site where the ectopic pregnancy is. Or the abdominal pain might be generalized, especially if the ectopic pregnancy has ruptured, you have generalized abdominal pain or shoulder pain. So this shoulder pain is referred pain from the diaphragm. So what happens is when an ectopic pregnancy ruptures, there is bleeding. And that bleeding goes into the peritoneum and it can reach the diaphragm. So there's irritation of the diaphragm which causes referred shoulder pain. Remember that the diaphragm is supplied by the phrenic nerve. And the dermatome for phrenic nerve is C235, which is the neck as well as the shoulder. There's history of amenorrhea for six to eight weeks, which you can confirm with the gravid index test. So why the six to eight weeks? Usually this is when a patient will present at six to eight weeks after their last menstrual period. Why? Remember that the embryo is growing in the fallopian tube. And remember that the fallopian tube is a small space which cannot accommodate for the growing and developing embryo. So by eight weeks, there's not enough space for that embryo. So what will happen is the fallopian tube will rupture. This is when the patient will present to you between six to eight weeks. The vaginal bleeding might be light vaginal bleeding or spotting. So in an ectopic pregnancy, you have an abdominal pain first, followed by vaginal bleeding. In miscarriages, you usually have vaginal bleeding first, then abdominal pain. But this is, of course, not always the case. The patient might present to you in hemorrhagic shock. So they'll present with dizziness or fainting or palpitations, or they might come in unconscious state. When you examine the patient, there'll be abdominal tenderness in the pelvic region or normal examination findings, especially in unruptured ectopic pregnancy. Whilst in a ruptured ectopic pregnancy, on general examination, the patient might be in shock. Why? Because there's intraperitoneal bleeding, which can result in hemorrhagic shock. So the signs and symptoms of shock are an ill-looking patient, an altered level of consciousness, the patient will be pale, will have a low blood pressure, the pulse might be tachycardic and cold extremities. On abdominal examination, there will be abdominal distension, especially in the lower abdomen. This is because of intraperitoneal hemorrhage. Acute abdomen, so you have a tense and tender abdomen. There might be colon or gray turner's sign. Colon sign is where there's bluish discoloration around the umbilicus because of the intraperitoneal hemorrhage. Gray turner sign is where there's discoloration in the flanks because of intraperitoneal hemorrhage. Paracentesis may be positive. In paracentesis, this is where you try to aspirate fluid from the peritoneal cavity. In a ruptured ectopic pregnancy, there is intraperitoneal hemorrhage. So when you aspirate fluid, you find that there's blood coming out. The uterus is usually normal in size or might be slightly bulky. On vaginal examination, there will be cervical motion tenderness, tenderness in the phonics or bulging of the phonics. There might be for vaginal bleeding. And caudocentesis may be positive. Caudocentesis is where you try to aspirate fluid from the posterior phonics, which leads to the purge of Douglas. So you insert a speculum in the vagina and you insert a long needle into the posterior phonics. So if you aspirate fluid, which will be bloody, it shows that the ectopic pregnancy has ruptured. Differential diagnosis of an ectopic pregnancy, a miscarriage, a nexotorsion, a ruptured ovarian cyst or torsion of the ovarian cyst, severe pelvic inflammatory disease, 
a ruptured corpus luteum, endometriosis, or acute appendicitis. Investigations in an ectopic pregnancy, what diagnostic test will you do? You do a gravid index test, which is a urine pregnancy test. Remember that these pregnancy tests might come out positive or negative. Even when there's an ectopic pregnancy, it might be negative because it depends on how much beta HCG is in the body. You send the patient for ultrasound. A transvaginal ultrasound is more specific than a transabdominal ultrasound because a transvaginal ultrasound would detect a gestational sac as early as four and a half weeks gestational age, whilst a transabdominal ultrasound would detect a gestational sac later on. So you've done a urine pregnancy test, it's come out positive, and the ultrasound has shown that the pregnancy is not in the uterus. Fine, you've confirmed that it's an ectopic pregnancy. But there are some situations the case is not obvious. Ultrasound will not pick up anything and the gravid index test might be negative. What will you do then? So if you're not sure it's an ectopic pregnancy or not, you can order a serum beta human chorionic gonadotropin hormone. Beta HCG is a glycoprotein hormone that's produced by the placenta. And it doubles every two days. Every 48 hours, it rises twice. So if you see that the beta HCG is not rising as it should, it's not doubling, this means it's an ectopic pregnancy. You can also do a laparoscopy in cases where you're not sure if it's an ectopic pregnancy or not. In a laparoscopy, you're actually visualizing directly. You'll see the anatomy of the fallopian tubes, the ovary, the broad ligament. So it will help you make a diagnosis of an ectopic pregnancy or not. Laparoscopy actually is the gold standard for diagnosing an ectopic pregnancy where the suspicion is very high. Dilatation and curettage can be done in cases where a transvaginal ultrasound has come out inconclusive and the beta HCG is high. It's higher than normal for an ectopic pregnancy when it's more than 1,500 milli international units per meal. So you can do a dilatation and curettage. So if you don't curate anything, it means it's an ectopic topic pregnancy but remember that D and C can be traumatic for a patient if you find that you've curated an intrauterine pregnancy so you have to be careful when making the de making the decision to do a dilatation and curettage you can also order a serum progesterone to check the levels of progesterone so more than 25 ng per meal means there's a viable pregnancy if it's less than 5 NG per meal means it's a non-viable pregnancy. But however, this test is not usually used because it's not specific. Another important test you should order a full blood count and differential count. Remember that the patient might be severely bleeding. And complications of severe hemorrhage are severe anemia as well as disseminated intravascular coagulation. So you want to check the levels of hemoglobin as well as the platelet count. You also want to check the blood group of the patient. Remember that recess negative patients should receive anti-D, even in an ectopic pregnancy. You can also cross match blood if they've lost a lot of blood for transfusion. You also do a bedside clotting time to check if there's an element of disseminated intravascular coagulation. Treatment of ectopic pregnancy can be medical or surgical treatment. Now remember a patient might present with you in hemorrhagic shock. So remember double intravenous access, replace fluid loss either by intravenous fluids or blood transfusion. But most of the time in a ruptured ectopic pregnancy, they will need a blood transfusion because of major blood loss. So in an ectopic pregnancy which has not ruptured yet, in an ruptured ectopic pregnancy, the patient is hemodynamically stable, meaning they're not in hemorrhagic shock. You have two options, a medical management with methotrexate or a surgical treatment, a laparoscopic salpingectomy or salpingotomy. So a medical management with methotrexate can take up to three to four weeks for the ectopic pregnancy to resolve. So what are the indications for medical therapy? The ectopic pregnancy should not have ruptured. It should be unruptured. The patient should be reliable and compliant for easy follow-up. The gestational sac should be less than 3.5 centimeters, and there should be no fetal cardiac activity. And the fluid in the pouch of Douglas should be less than 50 ml. Remember that methotrexate is a folic acid antagonist, meaning it interferes with DNA synthesis. So it actually affects 
all the dividing cells in the body, meaning the bone marrow, the gastrointestinal mucosa, as well as the respiratory epithelium. So it's contraindicated in breastfeeding mothers, in liver disease, renal disease. Remember that the liver and the kidney are part of the hematopoietic system. Contraindicated in blood disorders because it suppresses the bone marrow already. It's also contraindicated in peptic ulcer disease, in active infection because of bone marrow suppression. Methotrexate can reduce the immunity of a patient. So you don't want to give uh, methotrexate in a patient who already has an infection. You also don't give in active pulmonary disease. Remember, methotrexate can suppress rapidly dividing cells like the respiratory epithelium. Some of the questions that can come in MCQs regarding methotrexate are side effects of methotrexate. So which include nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, stomatitis, conjunctivitis, photosensitivity, as well as skin rash. The surgical management of an ectopic pregnancy which has not ruptured is laparoscopic salpingectomy or laparoscopic salpingotomy. In salpingectomy, you resect the whole fallopian tube, whilst in salpingotomy, you make a small incision or a small opening at the site of the ectopic and you remove the tissue. The advantages of salpingotomy is that, yes, it preserves the tube, but it increases the risk of having another ectopic pregnancy at the same site because of scarring, healing, and fibrosis. The advantages of laparoscopy versus laparotomy is that it can be used as a diagnostic tool. There's less blood loss involved. There's a shorter post-operation recovery time. There's a shorter hospital stay. There's less adhesions and has the best cosmetic result. But in cases where there's no expertise for laparoscopy, you can do an open laparotomy. In a ruptured ectopic pregnancy, in the hemodynamically unstable patient, the preferred method is open laparotomy because it's quicker and it's life-saving. Complications of ectopic pregnancy include hemorrhagic shock, disseminated intravascular coagulation, and because of the hemorrhagic shock and disseminated intravascular coagulation, it increases the risk of mortality. Long-term complications of ectopic pregnancy include tubal infertility as well as recurrence of ectopic pregnancy. This comes to the end of our discussion in ectopic pregnancy. Please don't forget to subscribe. Thank you.